Hello, how's everyone? Yeah, there are bright lights, so excuse me for not making eye contact with you guys. How's everybody doing? Um, there's nothing better to do on a cold, dark, rainy day than talk about suicide for an hour. So <laughs> let's go for it. Um, I am very happy to be here. Uh, it's, um, I know uh, many of you, and of course, know so much about this program for so long. It's such a pleasure to get to come and get to see you and get to talk a little bit about some of the research that we've been doing. So thank you very much, and thanks for that very generous uh, and kind introduction. Um, I, uh, am, I am interested in how adolescents' interpersonal experiences, particularly with peers, uh, play a role in adolescent adjustment overall. And it was a few years ago um, that I started to become interested in adolescent suicide. It was actually on my internship, thanks to the work of Tony Spirito. And he let me know that um, this was an area that needed much more research. I had never uttered the word suicide before I got there, but he explained to me that this was something that was very much strongly uh, relevant for understanding adolescent interpersonal stress. And what I'll be talking about today will be specifically the way that my interest in adolescent interpersonal stress uh, overlaps with um, some questions in adolescent suicide. So you're probably already pretty familiar with how important a problem this is. Um, over the past 20 years, there are a few different sources to give us some epidemiological estimates of the prevalence of suicide ideation and suicide behavior. And in general, there are a couple of things to take away from these data. Uh, the CDC gives us information from the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance System. And what you can see from these data, a couple of observations. The rate of suicide ideation over the last 20 years or so has generally been decreasing. You'll see that it's increased a little bit once we hit the economic recession a few years ago. But overall, we've seen a downward trend. And the um, estimates that we see are somewhat comparable to what we've seen from the National Comorbidity Study as well. But does, uh, despite the fact that we've seen a decrease in suicide ideation, and by the way, that's, uh, those rates are much higher for girls than they are for boys, we've seen no decrease in the rates of suicide attempts over the same period of time. So although there might be some factors that are playing into uh, less ideation reported by adolescents, we are still seeing the, pretty much the exact same number of attempts, which are remarkably high. So adolescent girls, over 10% of them, for the last 20 years, have reported that they have made an attempt to try and end their lives. Um, well, in the United States, as you know, there's not very much that we're able to uh, be excited about being number one anymore. But um, here's something. Uh, the United States does seem to be number one, tied with New Zealand, for having, in fact, the highest rates of suicide ideation um, and also particularly high rates of suicide attempts. And these are data from the WHO. I don't know what you all did in Canada to um, make the WHO angry at you, but they don't have any data for you, I'm sorry to say. Uh, so I, I'm not familiar with that, but I can say that the rates do seem to be particularly high among your southern neighbors. The high rate of adolescent suicidal behavior and also um, high rates of ideation is probably most related to a particular developmental vulnerability period, and that is the adolescent transition. You can see here the age of onset for um, suicide ideation uh, suicide plans and suicide attempts. And you can see that, uh, thankfully, there are not very many toddlers who are engaging in suicidal behavior. But starting around the transition to adolescence, you can see a dramatic increase in when this becomes relevant. And uh, that is also predominantly driven by girls. Uh, you can see that that's higher um, for each form of suicidal behavior. Now, this is not specific to the United States. For all of the countries in the WHO study, you can also see that the exact same time period is when you see the beginning of folks uh, starting to report ideation or attempts. I just wanted to briefly just uh, distinguish what I'm talking about with suicide ideation and attempts from suicide deaths. Of course, that's a different variable, uh, suicide deaths, and I won't be talking about that very much today, but I did want to note that, again, you can see that uh, the adolescent transition period um, which is this little period, oh, went away. Uh, this little period here, um, all the way to the left, you can see is also the period associated with a tremendous increase in the rate of suicide deaths. The only other time where we see any systematic increase in the risk for suicide death would be in, in, among the elderly. 
America is not number one uh, when it comes to deaths by suicide. Um, as David mentioned, I became interested, thanks to a student of mine, um, I became interested in other forms of self-injury as well, including non-suicidal self-injury. And as you all know, because you have a superstar in this area right among your, your faculty, um, non-suicidal self-injury is defined as intentional self-inflicted tissue damage, specifically without suicidal intent. And I just wanted to mention this because I am not going to be talking about this, and this is actually quite distinct from uh, what I will be talking about, and I wanted to make that differentiation. NSSI is also remarkably prevalent uh, in community samples and also particularly in clinically referred samples. In fact, if a child enters an adolescent inpatient psychiatric unit not engaging in NSSI, they probably will be by the time they leave their inpatient stay. Okay, so drawn roughly to scale, I will say that we know that um, there are many, many adolescents who are experiencing depressive symptoms, but really only a subset of those are reporting suicide ideation, most of them experiencing depressive symptoms. And of all those who are reporting suicide ideation, really only a small subset of those are actually attempting. NSSI overlaps dramatically with all of these constructs, but really it is quite distinct from suicide attempts, which will be the focus of this talk. Um, what we've been very interested in in the lab is specifically how to identify those folks in the smallest of red circles, well, also for suicide ideation. So why is it that only some adolescents who experience depression go on to report suicide ideation? And perhaps most importantly, why do only some ideating adolescents actually go on to attempt. And that's what we endeavored to find out in this uh, series of studies that I'll be telling you about. So um, it, suicide has been happening for millennia. So why are we still asking this very fundamental question about who engages in suicidal behavior and what the risk may be? Actually, this is a remarkably hard question to answer. Um, Thankfully, from a public health perspective, but, uh, but making life as a researcher difficult, suicide occurs with a relatively low base rate. So in order to understand who might be at risk for eventual suicide, it requires collecting data on many, many individuals. Um, typically, you'd like to collect that data from clinically referred samples uh, because they are at higher risk for engaging in suicidal behavior, but that makes it very difficult to follow these samples for any length of time to determine which might engage in suicidal behavior you do need longitudinal data, which is very hard. Um, because of uh, the complications that I'll mention in a moment about collecting these data, most of the research on suicide is collected as anonymous data uh, with a cross-sectional design, um, eliminating the ability to follow up with anybody who might be particularly at risk. That makes sense for understanding screeners, but it really has hindered our ability to understand prospective longitudinal designs. Um, the ethical and practical issues have literally kept me up at night for the last six years and probably before then as well because it is extraordinarily difficult to know exactly how to take the Venn diagram of what your IRB wants you to do, what your clinical training tells you is best to do, and what will allow you to sleep at night and somehow find the place where those three things overlap. Um, it goes something like this. You meet with adolescents. You tell them, as a limit to confidentiality, I want to tell you that if you tell me anything suggesting that you may be at imminent risk of harming yourself, I'll need to tell your parents. Okay, let's begin. First question, are you at imminent risk of harming yourself? And um, this makes it very, very difficult, much less once you find out information that suggests they may be at imminent risk, um, what do you do? Uh, not everyone needs to be rushed to the emergency room. In fact, that could be quite damaging to the child and to their parent who themselves might be experiencing severe psychopathology. Um, in a separate four-hour workshop, I could tell you all of the ways in which we figured out how to handle these issues. And my postdoc, Sarah Helms, did a wonderful job summarizing all of that in a paper that just went into the, uh, the Pediatric Psychology Clinical Journal. So please look at that if you're interested in how we, we attempted to fumble around some of those challenges. But this is probably one of the reasons why there's so little longitudinal data out there. Also, it's important to realize that this is an area where there's very little conceptual, there are very few conceptual models to help us understand why people may engage in suicide, including recent models that don't yet have lots of data. 
So what we started to try and do was to figure out how we might be able to understand uh, the predictors of suicidal behavior using long-term large, uh, excuse me, long-term large sample uh, longitudinal analysis. And in a study that we called Project Achieve, uh, which Dave and I were talking about before, it was a remarkably, uh, um, we thought, shrewd title to get people to turn in their consent forms. What parent's not going to want their child to be in Project Achieve? Um, uh, we did a study um, trying to understand interpersonal models to predict adolescent health risk behaviors. And this was a study of um, kids from a low income, uh, very ethnically diverse sample within North Carolina. We had about 400 kids. We collected data on them in ninth grade. And then we followed them every six months until they graduated high school. Just to give you a quick snapshot of what this study uh, involved, um, about half of them were female. Again, you can see it was very ethnically heterogeneous, and it was relatively low income. About 67% of the kids were eligible for free or reduced price lunch. We basically collected many, many different constructs that had been shown in the literature to be relevant for understanding suicidal behavior, especially those that might be relevant after controlling for suicide ideation and after controlling for depression. Very simple study among some of the variables that we looked at were some sociodemographics uh, looking at a variety of different forms of self-injury. And we simply looked at who committed, uh, who attempted suicide at any point from times two until the very end of the study. Very simple design. And here's what we found. In general, we found that while controlling for all of these predictors simultaneously in a logistic regression, we found that females were almost twice as likely to attempt suicide. We found that suicide attempts uh, made folks about nine times more likely to a uh, ninefold increase to attempt suicide. And also we found that non-suicidal self-injury was related to uh, suicide. In some ways, the results were quite exciting. They were among the first to demonstrate that NSSI in its own right was a predictor of engaging in suicide attempts. But in some ways, the results were not even a little bit exciting because what clinician wouldn't already be asking these questions with someone that they thought might be at risk for attempting suicide? You would want to know if they had any prior experience uh, with any of these self-injury, injurious thoughts and behaviors. So uh, that didn't stop us from trying to get it published, of course, but nevertheless, it didn't advance our theory as much as we hoped that it might. In a separate study that we called Project ADAPT, uh, we collected data from both a long, uh, clinical and a community sample to also try and understand long-term, particularly interpersonally themed predictors of adolescent suicidal behavior. Here we had about 531 adolescents in a community sample, but um, I want to talk about the matched sample of 150 adolescent inpatients um, who completed this, these measures during their inpatient admission and then for six time points every three months uh, following. And this sample was much more, uh, much more female uh, predominantly, ages 12 to 15, and you can get just a little bit of an idea of the sample. As we, we would expect from a clinically referred sample, there were a number of demographic possible risks. Um, people often want to know a little bit more about the sample in terms of diagnosis. So I'll tell you that about a third of them met uh, criteria using the C-disc for major depression. And depending on whether you were asking the child or you were asking the parent, they either had a little bit of disruptive behavior disorders or a lot of disruptive behavior disorders, which is not entirely surprising given what we know about different informants. Once again, we collected lots of information about sociodemographics as well as a variety of possible self-injurious thoughts and behaviors and a very broad profile of psychiatric uh, symptoms. We looked at which uh, suicidal ideation every three months after they left, and we looked at suicide attempts every three months after they left as well. And here's what we had uh, of the 143 adolescents for whom we had data. About half of them came into the sample due to an attempt or a recent attempt in their recent past. Uh, and, that, and that might have been their, um, either that was precipitated their psychiatric admission or um, it was something they had done a few months prior. Okay, this is not a great story for people in psychiatry because um, the results suggest that whatever happened on the inpatient unit didn't necessarily um, reduce the risks for subsequent attempts that much, but you can see within six months, the attempters, about a quarter of them, had already reattempted, And some of the folks with no lifetime history of attempts had also attempted a bit. <laughs> 
By 18 months, you can see that over a third of the attempters had reattempted, and about 13% or so had attempted for the first time since they left the inpatient unit. So our question was, what factors might predict who will go on to make an attempt at some point after they leave the unit? Well, we were able to use a latent curve analysis to look at a piecewise linear spline approach so we could look at their suicide ideation trajectory from baseline until the time they left at 18 months. Of course, they came in a crisis, so we would expect ideation to decrease uh, as soon as they leave the unit. But then you can see that we were able to model this as a remission slope where we saw that dramatic decrease in ideation. And then this subtle, significant positive slope where suicide ideation began to increase again as a sample. Cutting across those who had a lifetime attempt or those who did not have a lifetime history of attempts, about 13% of kids had uh, attempted since discharge by six months, and about 23% of our sample had attempted again by 18 months. So we were interested in predicting who might attempt above and beyond what we saw in this ideation slope. Um, again, the results uh, were relatively straightforward. They indicated that a baseline, having a history of engaging in suicide threats, made you more likely to be an attempter after baseline. Higher levels of baseline suicide ideation, slower recovery of ideation, or a more steep re-escalation of ideation, all predicted attempts by 18 months after baseline. Again, this is rare longitudinal data within the world of suicide research, but remarkably little information to guide clinicians or develop subsequent theory beyond what we might already have asked or known about for understanding risk for suicide attempts. In fact, if you look at the research at large for what we know about predictors of suicide attempts, there's not that much more out there. What we know are that the things that predict engagement in uh, suicide attempts are prior uh, levels of suicidal, uh, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. Maybe suicide threats are particularly relevant within a clinical sample. Maybe NSSI is especially relevant within a community sample. Um, other have researched a variety of other constructs, things like depression, which is really much more of a predictor of ideation than attempts. We know that uh, other forms of psychiatric um, illness may be relevant predictors of attempts, but not very strong odds ratios. There's an increasing literature on the IAT to look at implicit attitudes towards death and suicide that seems to be promising in understanding who might engage in suicide attempts. Um, the research on impulsiveness is a bit of a mess, unfortunately. Uh, beyond the difficulties defining that construct, depending on the informant and the task that or, and or task that might be used, the results are, are very inconsistent. And there's emerging literature to suggest that perhaps an acquired capability of suicide might be related to an engagement in suicide attempts, but longitudinal data actually are lacking. One of the issues, of course, is, um, so this, this is a suicide research that's been going on for 50 years, and, and sadly, we're not much further along than, than this right here. Still, these very broad, broad factors, and we would argue distal risk factors. Um, things that we might know about an individual that are not, uh, that are maybe going to predict an attempt perhaps months, years later. In fact, most of the suicide research has looked retrospectively at these factors to say that they were related with an attempt in the following decade or two. So we really don't have very specific models and they really don't tell us very much about imminent risk. We decided that maybe this entire approach needs to be changed. And instead, um, we really need to be focusing specifically on the experience of a stressor. If for adolescents, and for adolescent girls in particular, this is almost always an interpersonally themed stressor um, that precedes their engagement in suicidal behavior. And what are the proximal risk factors? What's happening between the moment that they experience a stressful event, particularly an interpersonally themed stressful event, and their decisions to engage in a, a suicidal behavior. And perhaps that focus would give us a much better sense of who is most likely, of, of what factors might be most relevant that we haven't already identified in prior work. So we decided to look at acute stress responses. So um, I have, last time I took biology was in 10th grade. Uh, so looking at acute stress responses, particularly with an increasing biological focus required uh, lots of reading, lots of thinking. And it, it turns out that um, 
after a lot of my reading, I decided to go forward with a bold hypothesis that inside the, um, the head, there seems to be an organ called the brain. And uh, I don't know much about it yet, but it appears that it changes quite a lot during the pubertal transition, which is the exact same time period that we see this increase in adolescent suicidal behaviors. So what might be happening within the brain that would be relevant? Well, what people seem to be talking about is that during pubertal development, there's of course the production of gonadal hormones that help stimulate the development of secondary sex characteristics, as well as neurological changes that are concomitant to puberty. And among those, some of those particularly are relevant for socio-effective circuitry. They activate specific dopamine receptors as well as oxytocin receptors. And those make adolescents especially invested in social rewards, a kind of bottom-up drive for social rewards and concern for social sanctions. So this is a time when kids are going to be especially concerned about anything that might be happening within the social milieu, thinking about what they can do to gain more rewards and avoid any kind of sanctions. This is interestingly seen across species, so of course it's not just for humans. Uh, we know that this is something that is relevant at the adolescent transition. From an evolutionary perspective, I guess we would understand this as uh, we're evolutionarily primed to start thinking that our parents are totally uncool, so that way we'll go hang out with our peers and we'll learn how to be more autonomous so we can go and fend for ourselves in the wild. Sadly, this is all happening before our executive control is fully developed, so while we have this strong drive for social rewards, and we don't yet quite know how to apply the um, kind of prefrontal cortex breaks uh, to engage in more inhibitory behaviors, to really be careful and thoughtful and planful in, uh, in some of these types of res uh, drives, uh, responses to drives for social cues. So as consequently, people hypothesize that there's, this is why we see so much more risk taking, so much more sensation seeking within the adolescent transition period. And this might be then pretty relevant for understanding why it is that interpersonal precipitants are especially uh, concerning for adolescent girls, for adolescents and adolescent girls. So we wanted to look at specifically the stress response, and we wanted to look at both biological and cognitive responses to stressors. Now the data that I'll be showing you for the rest of the talk are going to be looking at the results from a grant that we're just finishing up now. And this is actually our figure from the grant. Um, and we were believing that biological responses to stress might vary considerably. Uh, individual differences might be important to look at. And those folks that might experience a heightened biological response to an interpersonally themed stressor would then have diminished cognitive capacity to engage in more planful, adaptive responses. So specifically, we were looking at these um, bio and cognitive responses and I'll focus, well, six years ago, the hot thing on the block was cortisol. Now I think everyone is already pretty familiar with that. But we were looking at the HPA axis, some cardiovascular measures uh, of stress response. And we wanted to look at social problem solving, which has often been talked about as a possible modality for treating suicide adolescents. Our belief was that these stress responses, in combination with the experience of real life stress, would help us understand trajectories in the, these areas of self-injury, and I'll be focusing specifically on suicide ideation and suicide attempts. And of course, individual differences uh, in stress responses and in social cognitive responses might be predicted by those who are experiencing depression. And for girls, particularly those who are depressed and have externalizing symptoms or substance use or have early pubertal development, which we know is the worst risk factor for anything that we study among girls. So we um, wanted to look at biological stress responses. In particular, we looked at the HPA axis. I don't think I probably have to go through this in much detail. So you all know that the amygdala bone is connected to the hypothalamus bone and so on, and how that all ends up leading to cortisol. Um, there are two ways that you can look at cortisol, either by looking at diurnal rhythms, but also by looking at stress reactive cortisol, which is what we are most interested in to see how it is that cortisol changes pre post a stressor. We also looked at cardiovascular measures, including respiratory sinus arrhythmia, based on a polyvagal theory indicating that while our sympathetic nervous system might really help us to activate, fight and flight, run away from dinosaurs, the parasympathetic nervous system is really going to help us to um, counteract that sympathetic response and at least attend a little bit to which direction we want to go to find shelter and, and avoid being eaten. 
Um, PNS augmentation, therefore, is good. When the parasympathetic nervous system increases, uh, activates a little bit, that helps us to orient, and that can be okay. Um, PNS suppression, excuse me, PNS augmentation uh, is, is good for social engagement. PNS suppression is good in, in the face of stress. That way we can orient to uh, the best way to, to find safety. But complete PNS withdrawal, or RSA suppression, actually means that there's nothing stopping that sympathetic nervous system. There's no vagal break that's stopping us from having the full physiological response that we know may be associated with, um, with particularly bad uh, outcomes. In particular, it's suggested that a heightened sympathetic response, particularly HPA axis response, might be associated with um, gr uh, greater activation of receptors that are occurring in the amygdala near the hippocampus and not in the prefrontal cortex, again suggesting this more unbridled emotional response that might be associated with suicide. Um, RSA is thought of as being one way of measuring emotional regulation. For social problem solving, we thought that, um, I, I should say that, uh, so this work was done, of course, with a team of collaborators, and the co-PI was my former student, Matt Nock. And Matt and I have talked for a long time. We actually resisted the idea of DSM-5 uh, introducing a suicide type of diagnostic criteria because, um, this is not a disorder per se. Suicide is a failure of social problem solving, is our conceptualization. Almost any of us could be faced with enough stressors in a short period of time to find ourselves unable to think of an adaptive way out. And if we conceptualize suicide as a failure in social problem solving, it makes sense that uh, that's an appropriate treatment modality, and it also fits with current models of thinking about cognitive control. We're defining social problem solving, of course, as an ability to generate, select, and adapt appropriate responses to stressors. But the way that that's been studied previously in the literature is that we bring kids into a college campus psychology lab. We offer them some course credits and a candy bar. We tell them that they're wonderful human beings for being involved in our psych research. We have them fill out a questionnaire about their social problem solving in which they have to reflect upon their own abilities to engage in appropriate behaviors following a stressor. And that requires the kind of metacognitive skills and self-reflection that suicidal adolescents are really bad at doing in general. So this is probably the worst way of assessing social problem solving for this particular population. It's also often the case that um, because we're administering this in a calm, nice college environment, it's a cold condition. It's not when kids are activated. We can probably all remember situations in our own lives in which we thought we would act a certain way, but we found ourselves in the heat of a moment it, acting in a new, surprising, perhaps shameful way. And that suggests to us that, in fact, uh, we're not very good at knowing how we are going to how we're going to behave, or how we'll even plan to behave, in a hot condition, in a situation which we're actually stressed out. So that was our goal. We wanted to bring girls in, stress them out, take a bunch of bodily fluids, and see how they would do in social problem solving. And that's what we endeavored to do in Project Arch. So with great thanks to the collaborators, we got 241 girls to come to our lab. They were between the ages of 12 and 16. We were particularly interested in oversampling very clinically uh, affected youth because of our outcome variable. At baseline, we got lots of information from them, from a diagnostic assessment, from uh, information from a dyadic inter interaction uh, with their best friend. I'm not going to be talking about that part today. Um, we did a social stressor task, and then we followed up to look at their immediate biological, cognitive, and interpersonal responses. We followed them every three months for 18 months. None of this would have been able to get done uh, without this team, and anything good that came from the study whatsoever is 100% thanks to these amazing people who deserve to have their names up here for the entire time. So uh, the sample was all female. 40% of them came from local inpatient units. And all others came from the community, but were screened to ensure that they had significant levels of symptoms in the past two years. And we basically focused on symptoms of affective disorders, anxiety, substance use, or disruptive behavior disorders, kind of the most common forms of uh, psychological difficulties we would see at this age group. Um, because the meaning and salience of a social stressor would probably dramatically be different among somebody who is actively hallucinating PDD or MR. We excluded folks for those reasons. 
So at baseline, we did not recruit kids based on self-injury at all. They simply had to have psychiatric uh, illness within the past two years, even undiagnosed. But half of them um, had a lifetime history of suicide ideation. Um, and I actually don't have it on here, but half of them also had NS histories of NSSI. Just underscoring how prevalent this is in the samples that we're all seeing for whatever it is that we're interested in studying or treating. Um, we combined aborted, interrupted, and suicide attempts into one uh, um, categorization of suicidal behavior. And a third of our sample at baseline had a lifetime history of suicide behavior. So again, here's the figure that I showed you before in order to understand some of the predictors that, of uh, biological and cognitive responses that I won't really be talking about a lot today. We recruited that clinically referred sample. We brought them in the lab and we used a treer for an in vivo social stressor. We then followed them up and did a thorough assessment of their stressors across multiple domains at nine and 18 months. I'll tell you more about that later. And then every three months, we got information from them on their self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. We collected that information using the SIPI, which is um, a, now uh, well-known and, and always well-regarded semi-structured interview, um, using the KSADS format to get at um, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. Special thanks to West Elm and IKEA for helping us to design a fun adolescent lounge that had uh, lots of different kinds of stimuli to make adolescents comfortable, to sit in here at this table with their best friend, to fill out little panis forms on those envelopes as they went, and to ultimately stand in front of um, what was the oldest flat screen TV in the world to uh, do their Trier social stress task. Um, we had a male evaluator come in to watch them for that task. They had one minute to prep and then three minutes to deliver a speech on why they should be chosen for an MTV reality series on making friends among adolescents. But here it wouldn't be MTV, it would be, what's it called again? Much Music, right? That's the Canada MTV? Okay. Um, so for the social problem solving task, uh, also from Matt's lab actually, we um, used audio stimuli of interpersonally themed stressful experiences, asked adolescents to tell us how they would interpret that experience, what they would do, and then actually role play that right in front of us. Um, we recorded all of that information and we sent that up to Massachusetts and then that was coded by folks who did not have access to any of the other data in the study whatsoever. And from there we were able to get some information on the number of solutions, problem solving solutions, the quality of those solutions to each stressor, and then how much adolescents felt they would be efficacious in executing each of those uh, solutions. So here's what the lab visit what looked like. The kids came to our lab, we gave them a mini and the SIPI and lots of questionnaires and that took some time. Then they entered our fun uh, IKEA room where they were uh, oriented to the cameras and they were able to watch a baseline video that was especially boring. Um, after a while of those kinds of tasks, we had them engage in our spe uh, the Trier speech and then we had them sit around for a while while all their bodily fluids reverted to normal. We collected court in order to capture the moment at which they were most at rest, the moment at which they were doing the speech, and also at several time points after the speech so I could, we could understand regulation and recovery. We measured our social problem solving immediately before and immediately after the stressor with the idea that stress, uh, social problem solving should decrease in the face of stress. We connected them to a heart rate monitor from the moment they walked into the lab until they left. Okay, so we're just starting to look at the data. So um, these are preliminary, we're, we're just looking, we have a couple things in press, uh, but we are now starting to finally take a look after all this work. In fact, some of the participants are still going through their 15 and 18 month follow-ups now. So I'm excited though to tell you what we've been finding so far. So I showed you before our baseline levels of self-injurious behaviors. Here's what it looked like over the first, uh, we, because we only have complete data, up to nine months at this point, I'll show you that. But you can see that the number of suicide attempts at any given specific time point was relatively low uh, in suicide behavior. So we again collapsed across all the follow-ups up to nine months. So we could predict engagement in suicidal behavior um, at any point after they left baseline up to nine months. Um, so you can just get a sense of how much this is continuing to occur for these kids. <clears throat> 
Um, you know, the court literature is so confusing to someone that hasn't uh, really learned about this. Is our high levels good? Are low levels good? What's the story? Do you analyze it with area of the curve? Do you use different scores? It's a mess. So we came up with our own idea. Um, let's do latent trajectory analysis as a way of understanding possible um, response and recovery curves with the idea that there may be systematic individual differences in that. So what we did was we looked at different kinds of profiles of the court response and recovery, and we saw whether that might be associated with um, suicide ideation longitudinally. And we wanted to look specifically at whether that would predict ideation after controlling for depression, because that's our emphasis here. So we also looked at its associations with concurrent ideation. We predicted it at three months, and we wanted to control this above and beyond other known distal risk factors. So here's what we did. Um, we did find, in fact, that the majority of youth followed this middle dashed line normative response. So about 60% of them had a, um, res a court response, an HPA axis <coughs> response to the stress, um, which was modest but typical. And then by 40 minutes post-task, they had fully recovered. So that 40-minute point and the pre-task point are not statistically different from each other. So that was considered the normative response. We did find a group that was hypo-responsive. They were pretty much flat there, you could see. And that was just over a quarter of the sample. And then you can see that there was this hyper-response group that had a very exaggerated response to the stressor, and they did not fully recover, even 40 minutes after the stressor. Well, what we did here, you can see on the left, is we're predicting their uh, suicide ideation lifetime. So it's really a concurrent measurement uh, to the point, to the extent that both of those are measured at the same time. And on the right-hand side, you can see that these columns are odds ratios and confidence intervals for predicting suicide ideation three months later after controlling for baseline suicide ideation. And when it comes to looking at some of these distal risk factors, well, it looks exactly like we were talking about before. You can see here that depressive symptoms are important uh, related to suicide ideation concurrently and prospectively. Higher levels of pubertal status helps us understand who had a lifetime history of ideation, and impulsiveness also was related. This was from a self-report checklist. Um, it was also related to a uh, lifetime history of suicide ideation. But once we looked at our court response to the interpersonally themed stressor, above and beyond these effects, we found that that hyper-responsive group, and almost also the hypo-responsive group, but the hyper-responsive group, that was very significant and a very important predictor of who engaged in suicide ideation three months later. Let me show you what that looked like. So at baseline, 75% of the kids in this hyper-responsive group had a lifetime history of suicide ideation, which was obviously more than the kids in the other groups. After controlling for that, at three months, 42% of kids in that hyper-responsive group reported ideation at three months, which was two to three times more than the percentage in the other two groups that were reporting ideation. Okay, so good start. For RSA, we did a very similar type of paradigm. Here we are interested specifically in looking at some distal factors that might be related to suicide ideation, at this case at nine months. And then we were looking at some of these other factors that might uh, predict above and beyond. And in particular here, one thing that we did is we wanted to look at how much RSA may play a role in conjunction with actual sources of support that might externally help them to calm themselves down, essentially, to help them regulate. Um, so we looked at friendship support as a factor that could uh, provide them a source of emotional regulation. And we wanted to see whether there might even be an interaction between RSA uh, as well as friendship support. And we did find that. We found that their change in RSA pre-post stressor predicted ideation at nine months, but we also found this interaction with friendship support. And here's what that looked like. So as you can see, those with high friendship support in the dotted line generally had lower levels of suicide ideation at nine months than the people that didn't. That was what we expected. Excuse me, you can also see that there was generally a trend for low, uh, for RSA suppression uh, to make you a little bit worse off at the top. That's pretty much a flat line, but overall the trend was that RSA suppression was related to higher levels of ideation. But the effects of your friendship, your having a good supportive friend buffering you from having suicide ideation over time was only present among those 
who demonstrated RSA augmentation. Really suggesting a multi-level effect here, indicating that it was the, the ability of one's own body to uh, not remain highly activated during a stressor, times having a friend who also similarly might provide support to help you with emotional regulation. Only that combination was related to, in this case, the significantly different and lowest levels of suicide ideation likelihood. Okay, so I promised that we'd talk about predicting suicide behavior, and I've been sneaking some results by you that are really just predicting ideation. So let's talk more specifically about behavior. So remember, we gave the SPST, the self social problem-solving measure, immediately before and after the speech task. And among only those kids who reported suicide ideation between baseline and nine months, we wanted to look at whether there was a difference between attempters and non-attempters on how they fared with social problem solving pre, post the stressor. Well, the results were a little bit surprising. We expected that everyone would get worse at social problem solving over time, over from pre to post stressor. And that's not what happened. In fact, for the non-attempters, we saw that they had an increase in their social problem solving from pre to post stressor. Something that we have now realized might have to do with some practice effects in taking the social problem solving task several times uh, within close proximity to one another. What was interesting, however, was two things about the suicide attempters. First of all, in general, they were not so good at social problem solving. Pre, post, they were always worse than the non-attempters. But second, they did not seem to have the same gains that others did from practice. So although the nature of the interaction was a little bit different than we expected, it was broadly consistent with the idea that these are not kids who are doing very well under conditions of stress when it comes to social problem solving. And that interaction effect was almost significant. Can we predict suicidal behavior longitudinally? Well, as I mentioned, uh, we did not, of course, expect that the tree or social stress task would make them so stressed out that they would leave and be suicidal for nine months afterwards for having auditioned for a fake MTV reality series. But we hoped that that would provide us a window with how they respond to stressors that would really be most relevant if they then went on and experienced real life stressors. So the way that we measured real life stressors was using uh, the life stress interview, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. We conducted it at nine months post baseline. We're also doing it at 18 months. And it's a semi-structured interview that allows us to look at every significant stressor they've experienced across a variety of different domains. For every stressor that they report, we get information on the context, the timing, and the objective implications of each stressor. These interviews take about two hours each. Um, we then have a team of undergraduates code these for objective responses, objective stress. Most adolescent girls, regardless of the stressor, will say, that was the worst thing ever, oh my god, it was the most stressful thing, highest on the, on the scale. So we're really looking at objective stressors, uh, objective ratings of the stressors, so we can get a sense of how much was this a stressor that most people would find stressful. And that coding went really well. Um, in general, we did get a nice normally distributed curve of those objective stressors. And actually, the experience of stress was not different among those who ideated versus those who did not over the subsequent nine months. That was not relevant. But what we were hoping to find was that this experience of stress would predict attempts, particularly among those who had heightened biological responses to interpersonal stress. And it worked. Um, there's a lot more in this model than what I'm showing you here. But again, after controlling for those distal factors, and controlling for prior suicide ideation and depression, what we found was the combination of the hyper-responsive HPA axis to the TRIER in combination with interpersonal stressors had actually quite a high odds ratio for predicting who would attempt. Now, interestingly, this did not work for non-interpersonally themed stressors. It was only the interpersonally themed stressors in which we saw the effect um, with the hyper-responsive HPA. And here's what that looked like. Um, and again, you can see the hyper-responsive court with the high levels of interpersonal stress was related to a higher likelihood of suicide attempts, not for non-interpersonal stress. So in my reading, I found out that the brain is connected to other things in the body too. And um, one of the things that seems to happen is that when you are experiencing the kind of HPA axis or cardiovascular responses to stress, it's of course having a variety of effects um, that actually lead to intracellular processes. 
And now, collaborating with Steve Cole and George Slavich, we've been very interested in understanding how these intracellular processes might be relevant for understanding possible risks for suicide. In particular, it seems like in the context, not just any stressor, but in the context of social rejection, our bodies are saying, uh-oh, you're gonna get kicked out of the herd. There's a really good chance that you're eaten by a woolly mammoth sometime soon. So we better start developing some pro-inflammatory kinds of capabilities to help repair your torn off limb. And, um, and that particular process ends up having pretty big implications for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them, of course, is that when, these, uh, when that stressful experience and the signals that come from epinephrine or glucocorticoids get inside the cell, it actually tells dormant genes in our body to go ahead and turn on and get ready to be used. To me, this is like a scene out of X-Men, but I've been assured it does not happen in that way. So when these genes get turned on, um, that of course has implications for inflammation and inflammatory responses, including a variety of inflammatory health conditions, which incidentally we also happen to see more likely in females than we see in males. But it turns out that those pro-inflammatory cytokines that are byproducts of this process end up having a feedback system that crosses the blood-brain barrier and changes how we synthesize and process our um, uh, serotonin. So it actually then ends up uh, through a process called glucocorticoid resistance. And that might have something to do with why we then see these depression-like sickness behaviors. And it might even be related to the development of depression. Perhaps it's even related to suicide. I would refer you to some amazing work that's been done by George Slavich, including a recent psych bull paper from which I stole this figure and, uh, and explains this process in far better detail than I can. But when talking with them about this, and given my particular interest in understanding social stressors and social experience and how this might be particularly relevant, I thought, hey, I've got a freezer full of spit. Is there anything we can do with that to try and test these processes? This was obviously a post hoc analysis. So what we did was we took our freezer full of spit and we sent it to the UNC Dental School and they assayed it for tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-1 beta, and interleukin-6. Um, uh, and I mostly like saying those because it makes it really sound like I know what I'm talking about, that I can rattle off the names of cytokines. And what we found was that you can look at those, the level of those cytokines at um, time points that capture prior to the stressor and then after the stressor at significant enough time to be able to see effects on cytokines. Cytokines don't get shown up in saliva as quickly as, let's say, court does. The other thing you should know about saliva, of course, is that there are a lot of things that can really interfere with cytokine measurement in saliva. You could eat some crunchy chips and get a couple of little bruises inside your mouth, and that will affect your cytokines. So this is you know, preliminary at best. Um, but nevertheless, we are really excited and surprised to find that the assays works really well. And in fact, there was tremendous variability in how much there was gene expression in just the 40-minute period pre-post stressor. And that gene expression, when multiplied times the experience of actual interpersonal stress, predicted depression over nine months. So here you can see that interaction effect. Again, this did not work for non-interpersonal stress. It was just interpersonal stress in the subsequent nine months times high tumor necrosis factor alpha reactivity to the trier predicted depression. And what made us most excited was when we looked at it for interleukin-1 beta, there was a three-way interaction with pubertal development. So really going back to the beginning, suggesting that especially among those with advanced pubertal development, depicted here in the triangle and solid line, you can see that that effect of uh, cytokine reactivity times interpersonal stress was strongly associated with increases in depressive symptoms over time. Wouldn't it have been cool if that had also predicted suicide, given the title of the talk? It did not. But um, I uh, think that there might be promise there, uh, given our, our results on depression. Um, I just couldn't resist to show you this anyway, because it is uh, relevant and really consistent with our thoughts about what might be happening at the adolescent transition that is especially relevant, and particularly maybe for adolescent girls and the special salience of interpersonal stressors that might help us to understand why the experience, what proximal processes may be occurring, uh, what immediate stress responses might be relevant for understanding uh, risk. So overall, um, you know, our results from this, this one particular study are giving us some preliminary evidence to suggest maybe this is the right track. Maybe looking at some of these stress response factors 
will help us understand, with notable odds ratios, which kids are most likely uh, to be at risk for suicide ideation and behavior, even after controlling for all those distal risk factors that we've been studying for decades. Obviously, this has important implications. My belief is that within a couple of years, all of our iPhones will assay our cytokines for us if we just hover our thumb over it, and they will immediately send a signal to our pediatricians uh, you know, for adolescents to say, warning, high cytokine reactivity, this person may be at risk. Um, I'm somewhat saying that tongue in cheek, but yeah, mostly I am. Um, I think that biomarkers for, um, for stress responses are something that NIMH certainly thinks we're going to be able to do very, very quickly. Whether or not that's true, I don't know, but I do think that the idea of understanding more of an assay way of understanding risks for things might be a way to go, and this is hopefully generally consistent with that broader trend. Um, what I've explicitly ignored here is that there are very different types of predictors across different types of self-injurious constructs. What predicts threats, ideation, gestures, and attempts are likely different. I've kind of lumped them together here, and that's clearly a next step, is to understand how these models might vary for understanding the different forms of self-injury. And also, in particular, we want to understand now why some kids develop this kind of reactivity, whether it's cardiovascular, endocrine, or um, gene expression responses. We want to understand what experiences before or during puberty might really lead to these types of individual differences. So hopefully someone will fund my grant to do exactly that next. Thanks.